This is Metro Week. Our top story, the Pima County budget. We'll ask a top official why taxes could go up and see why the county may sue the state. We don't believe that's appropriate. We believe, frankly, it's probably illegal. Plus, our Journalists' Roundtable analyzes the week's news. It could be a lot worse, though. If, if the county were not cutting, the, the proposed tax increase would probably have to be about twice as much. Welcome to Metro Week. I'm Andrea Kelly. Pima County is working on next year's budget. The proposal includes spending less, but raising taxes. We'll ask about that later in the show, but first some of the basics. The budget setting process begins in the spring, when Pima County Administrator Chuck Huckleberry talks to all of the departments in the county about how much they want to spend. Then he writes a budget proposal, a draft of spending, and an estimate of how much money the county will bring in from various taxes. Then the five-member Board of Supervisors holds public hearings for feedback on the budget proposal. The board can make changes because it has the final say in how the county operates. Final budget approval and the associated tax increase or decrease comes on a simple majority vote. This year, Huckleberry is proposing the budget go down by $23.5 million. That's a 2% cut, and to cover it, Huckleberry is suggesting an across-the-board cut in all departments. The state shifted $23 million from the state budget to the county budget. Huckleberry says this, combined with previous cost shifts, means a third of the main county property tax goes to pay for things the state once paid for. This week I interviewed County Administrator Chuck Huckleberry for more details on his proposal for county spending. Your budget proposal includes less spending but a tax increase. Can you explain how that works out? Yes, uh, our aggregate budget is down again this year, fourth year in a row. Uh, but um, the property tax that's needed to support the budget is actually going to be more uh, than it is this year. I've proposed to the board an about 11 cent increase in the primary property tax rate. And what that translates into is about 2 to 2.5%. Two and a half percent. And, um, typically uh, for a homeowner who has a $152,000 assessed value, that's the average in Pima County, uh, that means about $17 a year tax increase. And that tax increase is simply because the state, uh, when they balance their budget, they balance it by shifting costs to Pima County. And this year they've shifted $23 million of cost, which is really unprecedented. It's, um, they balanced uh, their budget but uh, shifted all the cost to Pima County. Now I just want to clarify something you said. You mentioned the $17 a year uh, property tax increase, that's on the primary rate, so the main property tax? Yes, that's the primary property tax. It really supports all of uh, county operations, sheriff, county attorney, engine defense, the courts. Uh, we have a secondary property tax as well, and that's to support the library uh, and the flood control district as well as debt service. Uh, only thing I'm recommending with regard to the secondary property tax is a six cent increase in the library district and that's to get to a structural balance and um, that and a little more cost efficiency within the library district will allow us to probably forego uh, three of the four libraries we had proposed to close simply to become more efficient. And overall when you add all of that together that's how much of a property tax increase for that average homeowner in Pima County? Uh, for that average homeowner in Pima County it's $27 a year or roughly $2.28 a month. Okay, and then also your budget proposal says that this year's budget will end with about $14 million extra that you can put into savings. So um, I'm, I'm sure you will hear in the budget hearings that some people propose reducing the property tax increase by investing some of that savings just straight into the budget. What's your response to that? Well, our response is that we uh, have a fund balance and everybody needs a contingency fund or a rating day fund. It's called different things by different organizations. Ours is about as low as it should be. Uh, it really needs to be about 5 to 6% of our um, general fund. And what that means is it needs to be in the range of $30 million. And so you can see when we budgeted uh, $17 million and we came in with an extra $14, we're pretty close to where we need to be. So we need to keep that fund balance uh, as, as high as this 5% or 6%, and that's $31, $32 million. It also helps us uh, offset potential additional legislative shifts that may come uh, during the year because the shift to $23 million is not particularly certain at this point in time. 
Uh, we budgeted a, a portion of it, but another big piece of it could come from what we call the Property Tax Oversight Commission, and they aren't even going to meet until September, long after we've adopted a budget. So we need a fund balance to deal with contingencies. Now, some people might argue that uh, you're saving for a rainy day. Isn't a tax increase a reason to call this a rainy day today? You need more money. You've got some in savings. Well, we don't have enough in savings, and the tax increase is really a contingent tax increase. Uh, what I've said and recommended to the board is that uh, we're really increasing uh, taxes, the primary property tax, by about $8.1 million, and that's at 11 cents. And it's only because the state has shifted costs to us. Uh, we don't believe that's appropriate. We believe, frankly, it's probably illegal. Um, it will be challenged uh, in court. And if the county is successful in overturning the legislation that transferred those costs to our taxpayers, we're simply going to give that tax back. We will reduce our property tax rate back to what it is this year uh, if we're able to actually get a determination by the court uh, before August the 17th, the date at which we set our primary property tax and secondary tax rates for not only the county but every taxing jurisdiction uh, in the county. Now, um, we've talked. you mentioned the cost, state cost shifts to the county, and we've heard about those for years. So now you're talking about potentially Pima County suing the state to recover some of those costs. What's different this year? Why are you talking a lawsuit this year but haven't been in previous years? Well, and, and you're right. In previous years, we've, we've last year, we, we transferred $82 million to the state for state purposes. And I think a lot of people don't understand that a third of their property tax that the county levels, levies is sent to the state to support state programs. Uh, this year is different because it's really went from $82 million a year to $106 million a year, and anywhere in a range of between 8 and $18.6 million of that deals with state aid education. What is that? It, it is really the 1% homeowner property tax rate cap. And in 1980, the voters in Arizona passed a constitutional amendment that said no residential property owner shall pay more than 1% of the, their, their value in, in property taxes. Anything above that is paid by the state. Uh, and that's when you combine the tax rates of the school district, the county, the community college, and all the taxing jurisdictions within the county. Um, the state in 1981, the Arizona legislature, adopted a law in which to implement this constitutional amendment, and that law says that the state would pay for the excess cost. Uh, that's been the law and that's been the practice in Arizona for the last 35 years. Well, suddenly this year, the state determined that in order to balance their own budget, uh, they needed to come up with uh, additional revenues, and therefore, let's not pay these monies to the school districts that uh, they're due in, uh, let's make the county pay that. And um, that's happening not only in Pima County, uh, but Pinell County and potentially other counties in Arizona. And so that's really a, a shift in, in tax burden between the state and the county. And we think that's unlawful. And um, there are a number of constitutional grounds that we believe um, the, the law is improper. And I think that you'll see the county file litigation, probably a petition to the Supreme Court uh, within the next two weeks to ask that the law be declared invalid. And if that occurs, there won't be any need for any property tax rate increase in Pima County. We won't have one. We hadn't planned on one this year until the state shifted the cost to us. We hadn't planned on one for next year. We were basically going to hold uh, the property tax rates constant and, uh, and, and continue to operate within those revenues that come from that levy. And overall, you're talking about a 2% cut for departments in the county next year. What has already been cut? What, what are we not seeing in county services now because you've been balancing the budget? Well, what you see is, is uh, since the, the Great Recession began and actually began to impact, um, we'll say, property tax revenues in 2010, uh, we reduced most county expenditures by 12%, uh, except for law enforcement. We only reduced law enforcement about 2 to 3%. This latest 2% is in response to uh, the, the cost shifts from the state. As, as I said, what's legally in dispute is between 8 million and 18.6 million. The state transferred 23 million of cost shifts to us. We have absorbed the difference. And, and what we've done is just basically that's where the 
comes from. Uh, and so we've cut back everybody 2%. I don't think you'll see any significant drops in services, uh, but we're right at that margin that says that any additional impacts will start to affect uh, everybody. Um, we'll say they'll begin to see that in, in, in service. Uh, probably the most sensitive area in service is law enforcement. They're probably at their lowest uh, funding level they can be at without seeing some very significant reductions in services in response times. So if you had to make further cuts, that's where they would, they would keep coming from all departments, including law enforcement? Yes. Um, it, historically, we've held law enforcement harmless. And frankly, that's not gotten us uh, very far. Uh, it's uh, preserved uh, public safety to the greatest extent possible. But the type of cuts that we're seeing now is that um, we can't continue to cut uh, a little bit at a time without uh, ultimately affecting service or taking one functional area of county government out of operation. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, the component that we fund with the general fund that's not mandatory, discretionary, is our Natural Resources and Parks and Recreation Department. And I think it's, it's really inappropriate to cut that because uh, that's the kind of service that most taxpayers utilize or see. A lot of our services are criminal justice, John, ju law and, and justice related, and uh, most typical, um, we'll say taxpayers, don't get a direct benefit from it. They get an indirect benefit because it's a safer community, uh, but you know who wants to avail themselves of the services in our jail? Uh, or who wants to be prosecuted by our county attorney or defended by a public defender? Those are necessary things uh, for an orderly society and a functioning government but uh, most taxpayers don't see the direct benefits of that. They get the indirect benefits from having uh, public safety. Thanks for coming in to explain it to us. Thank you. The county budget typically passes on a party line vote with Democrats supporting it and Republicans opposing it. We asked for interviews with Republican supervisors Allie Miller and Ray Carroll. Neither was available this week. We'll keep asking and bring their points of view to you when they're available. For now, we'll be right back with the Journalist Roundtable. Arizona's economy, more money is coming in than expected, and new sectors are contributing. Arizona actually is in the top five of all 50 states for visitor spending of national parks. We're looking at nearly a half a billion dollars in state and local tax revenue from that activity, so it's a big deal. Now our Journalist Roundtable. Joining me in the studio this week are Dylan Smith of the Tucson Sentinel, my colleague Vanessa Barchfield of Arizona Public Media, and Kurt Prendergast of the Nogales International. Thank you all for coming in today. Dylan, on the topic of the county budget, county, we heard County Administrator Chuck Huckleberry reference that the, the property tax increase he's proposing is pretty minor in the scheme of things. Do you think taxpayers agree? Well, taken individually, just a $20 increase in you know, tax for an average home is not that much, but you have to look at the possibility of will the county pass, voters pass the county bond, will voters pass a city bond, you know, in the aggregate you could be looking at, uh, you know, a, a rather more significant tax increase. Nothing that's going to break anybody's bank, certainly. If you own a home, you can probably cover these taxes, but, you know, every little bit uh, starts to eat away with, you know, your, your, your budget, your household budget. It could be a lot worse, though, it, if the county were not cutting the, the proposed tax increase would probably have to be about twice as much as what they're talking about. They're cutting an equal amount as up to what they're talking about raising the, uh, the property tax. We should also add that uh, also on property tax bills are school district budgets and those are also still being worked out as we speak. Everybody has until the end of June to figure out what they're going to be spending and how much money they need to raise to do that. Yeah, the, the school districts, there's also the, the little bit of extra proposed for the increase and in, for the, the library district to uh, avoid having to close some of those library branches. Now, um, I asked Administrator Huckleberry also if he thought that, uh, that the, the county bond election that's happening in November with seven questions where people will be asked whether they want to raise their own property taxes, if there's any risk in putting that on the ballot after potentially having a, a tax increase earlier in the year with this budget. And he said he thinks there, there might be a little bit of confusion among voters, but that um, he thinks they'll understand that in November they get to choose what they want versus in June and when the county takes its budget vote is required. D what do you think about that assessment? Well, Pima County voters have a you know, two-decade track record of approving bond increases. And uh, 
over time, we end up paying these bonds off, so it's not like the increase in property tax it keeps getting piled on with each bond election. It, it sort of you know, go, fluctuates over time as the bonds get paid off and we float out new ones. So you know, given that people will have the, the chance to say yes or no to several different questions rather than just one big package deal, you know, they can really make an informed choice about the, these are the things that we should invest in as a county and maybe not this one and maybe these others. And all, also in the context of whatever the supervisors decide to do about this budget. Yeah. We should also just point out that the, the supervisors do have the final say on this budget and they haven't taken a vote. So the property tax proposals that we're talking about today could change. It, it's certainly general. possible. We haven't seen that a lot, though. Well, you know, they generally have accepted, with some minor modifications, whatever budgets that Huckleberry has proposed. So that's, you know, if you were betting on it, you would bet on the, the supervisors approving this. Now, Kurt, the Nogales International newspaper is in, of course, Nogales, the city, mm -hmm. which is in Santa Cruz County. We just heard Huckleberry say that Pima County may consider suing the state over some of the cost shifts that the state has, has shifted to Pima County taxpayers. What is Santa Cruz talking about about those cost, shift, cost shifts at this point? Well, with regard to the lawsuit, uh, I asked around and it looks like they are not going to join that. Uh, I don't think they are, our burden is that big to where we would you know, join that. But uh, during the, uh, the budget season at the state, the uh, county supervisors, county manager and everyone uh, is kind of like a, a what's next? What's the state going to put on us this year? And so the two big ones that came up this year were uh, the, uh, the state shifted 25% of the cost to incarcerate uh, juveniles to the counties. And for Santa Cruz, that comes $89,000, which is not nearly as the numbers that you have in Pima, but are significant in Santa Cruz. It's all in context, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another one is the uh, Department of Revenue is going to take over the uh, tax collection. And they're shifting that cost to the county as well, which is going to be about $80,000. And the context for us in Santa Cruz is that our sales tax revenue is dropping, our population is declining, and our property valuations are going down. So any little bit hurts quite a bit. Now, give us some sense of the size of the Santa Cruz County budget, the existing budget, compared to, we talked about Pima County being about $1.2 billion mm -hmm. a year. So ours, the, the, the current one is uh, about $75 million. Uh, that's down from about $100 million five years before. And they have not, there is no proposal for a budget yet, uh, but that'll be coming in the next month or so. In the next month or so, the proposal will come, and then the same process, the county supervisors have to approve it. Yeah, right. We'll have the proposal, and then we'll have a tentative budget, and then we'll have our final budget, and then any tax increase they choose. Is there any talk of tax increases yet? Um, not yet. There has been no talk whatsoever of the budget yet, but I, I imagine there will be some talk of a tax increase as the time goes by. We've had to do two in the last two, two years. So. Can you give us any specific examples of the kinds of expenses the state has shifted to the county over the years, even if not just this year? Yeah, sure. Um, one of them uh, I think is really interesting is we have, uh, for the last five years, we've been paying about $250,000 to house an inmate at the Arizona State Hospital. Uh, he was convicted of double murder, sentenced to death, and then it was shown that he was uh, not mentally competent to be sentenced. And so as the, sh the state shifted those costs uh, to house these people to the counties, Santa Cruz's share went up. Uh, and so we ended up paying about $1.2 million in recent years. And incidentally, uh, also Pima County uh, has shifted a cost to Santa Cruz County uh, <laughs> to, to get around this return to competency thing. Uh, Santa Cruz contracted with uh, Pima because Pima was like, the state is shifting all these costs to us, we're going to do it our own and do it more cheaply. So Santa Cruz contracted with Pima and we were paying $20,000 a year. Now it looks like we're going to pay $40,000 a year. So that trickle down from the state kind of keeps trickling down. Absolutely, yeah. From the state to a large county to a smaller county. Mm -hmm. All right, Vanessa, I want to touch on another topic this week, a big topic in the news. Um, just yesterday, the Arizona Board of Regents voted to allow students who have been granted deferred action under the president's uh, deferred action program, which deferred deportation program, um, in-state tuition. Can you give us kind of a rundown of what that means? Yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of background first. Um, so when Barack Obama introduced the, the DACA program, deferred action for childhood arrivals, uh, a number of community colleges around the state um, started granting DACA students in-state tuition. Um, Pima, Pima Community College uh, granted it, as did the largest um, community college system in Phoenix, Maricopa Community College. When they did that, uh, then Attorney General Tom Horn sued the community college, saying that they were violating a 2006 law that um, says only people with lawful immigration status um, can qualify for in-state tuition. On Tuesday of this week, a Maricopa County Superior Court judge 
um, sided, ruled in favor of the community college, saying that it's the federal government, uh, not the state government, that determines who is lawfully present in the state. And so, of um, course, with the permit to, to not be deported, that's a lawful status. That's a lawful status, exactly. So the Board of Regents called a last-minute meeting. Um, we went. I was there yesterday morning. Um, they basically went immediately into an executive session where they heard from their attorneys, uh, called us back into the room about 30 minutes later, and announced that um, their decision was that the judge's ruling establishes a new legal precedent and they will comply with the law. So as of yesterday, all students with DACA, st DACA status um, now get in-state tuition. Now the regents were otherwise going to discuss a, a different proposal for students who've received that status. What's the, what's the status of that proposal at this point? Okay, so yeah, actually on Monday, they had already convened to talk about um, tuition rates, to set tuition rates at the state's three public universities. Also at that meeting, they discussed a proposal which they introduced last month um, to charge students who had graduated from an Arizona high school and had spent three years in school here 150% of the tu in-state tuition rate. So it established sort of a new um, tuition rate for students. Um, it would have applied to DREAMers, to people with DACA status, uh, but it also applies to, say, uh, uh, an Arizona, uh, someone who graduated from the Tucson High, moved away for a few years and lost their Arizona residency. Um, so that, that proposal is actually still standing. They're, they, they will take a decision. They're expected to decide on it, to vote on it at a meeting next month. Do we have any um, information about why the regents did not already have that discussion when they set the rest of tuition this week? Um, Background on timing, why, why they were deferring the conversation about DACA students anyway? Well, they, they, this was always the timeline of the proposal, that they would take a vote on that proposal. Separately? In, yes, separately. Okay. It had nothing to do with the rest of the tuition setting process. And it was a, a, a sort of late proposal. I mean, it was introduced only last month. So that sort of taking the vote later gave them more time to consider exactly. it before the vote. Okay. Do we have any idea how many students we're talking about here? How many uh, either at the community college level or at the university level? The uh, Board of President, Board of Regents President Eileen Klein was asked that yesterday. She says they don't keep track of the numbers. We do know that there are 23,000 students, or people with DACA status in Arizona. Obviously, just like the general population, not everyone is gonna to wanna to go to college, so we don't know how many people um, we expect to move from a community college to um, maybe the U of A next year, but um, 23,000 are now eligible for in-state tuition. And not everybody who's eligible for DACA has been applying, so it's possible that uh, this might be a, an additional a little bit of, of perk to get people to uh, sign up for that. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. What's the reaction from students? We know you had some radio stories on this morning about, about that. So who, who did you talk to and what did they say? Yeah, there were a few. Actually, I don't think that anyone really expected that the Board of Regents was going to take that decision yesterday. Um, it was a pretty big surprise to everyone that was there. So there weren't that many students present at the meeting. It was mostly media. Um, when, they, when they made the announcement, it was very emotional for the few students who were present. You know, the women standing next to me um, embraced and were crying. Um, I've spoken with several students who have said that they will either switch from Anna Rodriguez, for example, who has been in several of my stories, is a, a mechanical engineering student at Pima Community College. She's finishing up this year, and she says she will be going to one of the, the state's three public universities next year as a result of this policy reversal. And she had previously said that she wouldn't have been able to afford out-of-state tuition. Yep, exactly. So it opens an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, um, do we have any insight on whether this is, this is a final decision or whether there could be another court case? I mean, we had one court case. What's the potential future of this decision? Um, well, it pretty much depends on what now Attorney General Mark Brnovich decides to do. He issued a statement yesterday saying that um, a new lawsuit is not, um, it, it is one of the options being considered. All right, and I also want to mention that Vanessa will be joining us again next week. We are doing a, a full show on U of A issues, including some of these tuition discussions. So we might get some more answers from the university next week. Yeah. Kurt, I want to touch on another story that you've been working on, which is about money laundering um, and the, actually the, the prosecution of money laundering in Santa Cruz County. Um, why don't you give us the background on, on where the money came from for this special prosecution action? Okay, sure. Uh, so this is from a 2010 court settlement between the Arizona Attorney General's uh, Office and uh, Western Union. 
Uh, there's a lawsuit saying that Western Union had allowed hundreds of millions of dollars to be laundered to drug cartels in Mexico. So they settled. I think the total for the settlement was $94 million, and $50 million of that went to the Southwest Border Anti-Money Laundering Alliance, which also knows as Paul. Okay. And uh, so what, if in Nogales, what that equates to, it happens, it happens across the state. In Nogales, we have uh, Interstate 19 runs into the city, and we'll have Nogales Police Department cars uh, parked on the highway. And the, when they're doing this, working overtime for the S-Ball, what they do is they stop you for a traffic violation and then see if you have any kind of contraband on you. Uh, and then they'll seize it, and that will go back into the fund. Uh, and they, they, the officers also make their overtime pay on it. So that, that was been going on for the last, like, three years or so. And in September, the funding, uh, their grant ran out. And so now we don't have MPD patrol cars stopping people on the, on the highway as they come down. And it looks like it's drying up for everybody. They've given out some grants that are going to keep going for another year or two or three. But uh, Nogales is done. And I think the F Phoenix Police Department, DPS, and a couple other Arizona agencies still have some grants that are going to keep going. Was that an effective program, having some rather obvious cops sitting by the side of the road pulling I mean, people over for an improper lane change and seeing what they've got in their car? I don't know how you measure the effectiveness of these types of programs. Uh, they did seize hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the officers made some money off of it. And, you know, the money they seize, I guess that's less money going into Mexico uh, and so to, you know, in illicit cash. So I guess that's a, a positive step. Can we tell at this point what the implications will be for the city of Nogales or other parts of the state? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, like, like the, the question of how effective it is is also a very good question. So what kind of impact it's going to be, it has had, is also uh, very questionable. But it has stopped some money, and so I, I don't know what uh, an Arizona resident, how their life would change as a result of this, but it could have some type of incremental effect in Mexico with less you know, drug money going in that could help the situation there. Somewhere. And that's been the goal of the program. That's the idea of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Dylan, uh, speaking of, of border security, um, we found that some local Tucson area people were appointed to a Homeland Security Commission this week. Can you give us the details on that? Yeah, there's a, uh, you know, throughout the federal government there are a number of advisory committees where they have you know, government officials from various local levels and experts in the field and things. And one of those is in the Department of Homeland Security, specifically uh, mostly focused on border security. And uh, this week, uh, former Congressman Ron Barber and the chair of the Tohono O'odham Nation, Ned Norris, were appointed to that the uh, Homeland Security Advisory Council, they call it. What will they be doing? Um, it's, you know, uh, basically to, in one way, give political backing to whatever the Department of Homeland Security wants to do. They go to some people and they say, oh, yes, that sounds like a great idea. That's one side of the, the, the political side of the coin. The other side is to actually get some input from people who have a little bit more direct experience with things so that we're not having all of our decisions just trickle down from Washington, D.C. So it kind of works both ways. Now, we know that Ron Barber is not running for uh, election against Martha McSally, the, the congresswoman in the seat now who beat him in November. Is this a way for him to be politically involved or build toward any other political involvement, or is this kind of a low level, not very... I, I don't know about building for anything. It's, it's a way to stay involved, and, uh, you know, for somebody who has been in public life for so much of his career, I think that you know, he wants to do that in some way. But as far as uh, taking another run for uh, elective office, I don't see that in the cards. And is it significant that we have two Southern Arizonans, Tucson, Tucson area Arizonans um, on that committee? Um, s somewhat. I mean, it is a, a long border. You would expect to see, a, you know, probably more people from Texas considering the population differences. But it also, you know, comes down to politics in a way. You also reported this week on some Tucson area schools that are under investigation for possible cheating on the statewide standardized testing. How did this come, to come about, the investigation? Well, cheating is a harsh word at this point. We really don't know what's gone on. The uh, State Department of Education reviews Ames testing pretty thoroughly, looking for, you know, sort of suspicious patterns. And they noticed that uh, in a number of schools across the state, eight across the state, and uh, two charter schools here in Tucson, there was a rather suspicious-looking number of answers that were erased and then changed to be correct. So they asked the attorney general to look into that and see if there might be anything more to it. How many schools in the Tucson area? Two of them, two, char two local charter schools. And which ones were they? Um, Edge Charter School, and I don't remember the name of the other one, I'm afraid. But they're both charters, yes. not district schools. Yes. Okay, and any sense of how long the investigation will run or what could happen at the end of it? Well, at, at this point, we don't really know what the Attorney General's office is going to do with the request by the uh, state schools chief. So we'll, we'll see if they think it's serious enough to start digging into first. All right, well, if there's an update on that, we'll bring it to you.
Thank you all for coming in today. Before we go, we want to remind you that we can find all the stories we produce at Arizona Public Media on our website. We're also launching a new project called Favorite Places, and you can submit photos of your favorite places online and through social media. Next, Arizona Week looks at the changing state economy.